Next, we'd uh, thank you, Stephanie. Sorry, that was a very informative talk, and it's very exciting now that we've got this registry that we can hear the latest developments and what's actually going on with this real life study that you're doing with keratoconics and cross linking. And it's, it's fabulous to hear from a patient perspective as well. Um, could I invite Jim Kokinakis? Um, up to the stage, he's an optometrist who has had over 35 years of experience. And apart um, from the normal eye care that he does, he has a special interest in keratoconus, corneal grafts, dry eyes, and digital eye strain. I think being a person that has to work as an optometrist with keratoconus must be a very difficult job. And I've heard some stories from my optometrist in particular. Um, we get a little bit of a reputation as keratoconics. So. <laughs> Um, he's a council member of the International Society of Contact Lens Specialists and an adjunct senior lecturer at the Optometry School, University of New South Wales. He has also lectured globally to optometrists, opth ophthalmologists, it's very hard for me to say that, sorry, GPs and pharmacists. So thank you for giving up your time tonight and to um, share with, with us a little bit more about keratoconus and contact lens wear. I'd like to thank the Institute for inviting me here tonight and um, I can see a few of my patients uh, sitting out on the uh, chairs there. No, no tomatoes, please. <laughs> it's interesting about uh, keratoconus uh, personalities and I, I've got a theory. That there's actually been a study done on that and believe it or not, and um, they come up normal. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, that's a good question. Um, the thing is, is that if you're not getting a, um, a solution to your vision problem, uh, it can be very, very distressing. And consequently, you can develop a type A personality that uh, keeps coming back and bugging us uh, poor eye practitioners. So anyway. Sorry, it's bad. No, you're right. I'll try not to make my talk too long because I think um, it's far better if we get questions on the panel. Uh, one of the things I've learned in 35 years of dealing with people with a keratoconus is there's not two, no two people the same. And it just amazes me. Uh, I get all these questions and the older I get, the less I know because um, everyone's unique. And when they turn up, I can only refer back to all the other thousands of people that I've seen with this condition, but the person that's actually sitting in the chair is actually a unique individual with a unique life and uh, a unique um, expectation in life. And uh, that's where the challenge becomes, is the communication and then to find the uh, best solution for that particular person. Um, do I just press and just move on? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Um, so uh, the title, I've called it uh, The World is Your Oyster because the reality is is that um, with, with appropriate management, um, keratoconus, uh, people with keratoconus actually do quite well. They, they hold down jobs. Um, they can do virtually anything. Um, I'll show you a few things you probably shouldn't do, but um, there, there's opportunity everywhere with keratoconus. Um, so just in summary, um, I'll share with you some common misconceptions about keratoconus, or in my world anyway, uh, what you shouldn't do and then uh, what in fact you can do with this uh, eye condition. So some common uh, misconceptions is that life is over. Um, we get the, the typical first up uh, consultation is uh, usually a teenager, not uncommonly uh, in their HSC years and their vision is failing. And next thing you know, they've turned up, they're a new patient, and mum and dad are there, grandma and grandfather are there. And, uh, you know, it's a crying match at the, at the end because they, they think that their child is going blind. And in fact, um, you don't go blind from keratoconus, especially if it's managed properly. There are, I mean, there are cases that uh, have had hard luck and they've gone through multiple graphs and things like that and uh, they've ended up with a, a bad outcome. But the reality is if managed appropriately up front, you find that um, you don't go blind from keratoconus. They, another thing that um, I'd need to get across is that uh, hard lenses uh, 
a thought to stop the progression of keratoconus. This is, this is not true. Uh, in fact, there are studies that show that uh, inappropriately fitting contact lenses potentially progress keratoconus. So if you press on the, on the cone or the, the apex of the cornea too much, you in fact can scar it and then make the uh, problem worse. So an appropriate fitting is very important. One of my, another one is uh, uh, another procedure which I, I've noted, uh, which I'm glad hasn't really been mentioned too much today is uh, intacts. Um, they say that intacts apparently makes contact lens fitting easier after the, getting an intact procedure. It doesn't. Um, it, uh, it makes it considerably more complex. And, and another misconception is they think that the person will think they'll never drive and um, things like that. You know, and the reality is, is that um, most people end up with more than satisfactory vision to uh, end up uh, participating in life in a, in a full way. So what is the reality? Well, the reality in my world anyway. Um, let's make an assumption that uh, the keratoconus has been managed properly. Um, no one's going to go blind from keratoconus. And there are very few things that you should really avoid. But I will share a few of them with you. Tips for just some tips of successful vision management. Because at the end of the day, you have an eye condition. At the end, the, the person just wants to see, right? So we can start talking about diopters and numbers and uh, all this stuff. And uh, you know, you're mild, moderate, or severe. But at the end of the day, you just need to see. So where possible, I'm a I'm a big believer in uh, the best possible glasses. I mean, whoever designed eyes, I can guarantee you didn't design them to put a bit of plastic on there. Now I'm a contact lens specialist. Well, I shouldn't be saying that, should I? I'm a contact lens practitioner. <laughs> um, and I wear these. So, you know, all I do all day is prescribe contact lenses, yet I wear glasses. So ask yourself why. Well, I, firstly, I couldn't be bothered. That's one reason. I'm too old. Um, maybe that's another reason. But the reality is, is that contact lenses from morning till night it can be a little stressful on the eye, especially in today's digital world. So if, you, if it's possible to get a decent pair of glasses that can make you even somewhat function, it's a good idea. I have a very simple contract with my patients and it's uh, this. One of the things that we, we know, uh, or we think we know, we think we know a lot of things um, that promotes keratoconus progression is eye rubbing. Allergy seems to be related to uh, keratoconus and that gives you itchy eyes and then from there you rub. So the patient needs to promise to me to minimize their eye rubbing. I promise to fit lenses properly and they need to sit in the chair as required. And I think if we end up with those three points and we're compliant in that area, you'll find that um, everyone will get sorted out pretty well. When the, an appropriate referral needs to uh, go for cross-linking, it needs to be done. Um, I see patients uh, offered cross-linking in their 40s sometimes. I, I, I start thinking, is that an appropriate thing to do? Yet for someone, as uh, Stephanie said, under 21 is, uh, is a, definitely a big risk factor for progression. And I think that's really the area that uh, cross-linking is going to get most value in. Uh, oh. Okay, so uh, some of the things that you should not do in contact lenses you shouldn't really be swimming in contact lenses. And uh, in fact, you shouldn't shower in contact lenses and you shouldn't rinse your contact lenses in tap water and you certainly shouldn't spit on them and put them in your eye. <laughs> I know, I've, I've heard every story, I can assure you. Um, I have professional um, water polo players that actually play in uh, scleral lenses. They're, they give them actually an advantage in the game. You can splash them in the eye and uh, they won't blink because uh, it won't. So scleral contact lenses, but I, I do not say, uh, recommend that you s uh, swim in contact lenses. It's a very high risk for a, uh, an eye condition called a cantamoeba and it's a disaster. Now, it doesn't happen frequently, but if it does, um, it's, life's not worth living at that point in time. It, uh, and I'm sure that uh, Stephanie uh, knows all about it. She's the, she's the one that we dump these people on in the end. Um, you shouldn't sleep in contact lenses. The oxygen transmission to the eye is dramatically reduced. Uh, people forget, of course. Um, maybe climbing Mount Everest. Maybe that's not a great idea uh, in contact lenses. Anything, if you go camping as an example, and you have to overnight 
there's a hygiene issues. And I said, you shouldn't sleep in them. So therefore, um, it can get a bit tricky. Now, there are people that uh, can manage the logistics of that. But hygiene is, uh, is the key issue uh, if you're going to be doing um, extreme things like climbing at Mount Everest. Just to let me share you some of the contact lens types that we fit. And um, there is no right answer for the uh, contact lenses. You really need to, the, each individual has um, the, a unique corneal shape with an, a unique eyelids, with a unique blinking mechanism and a unique ocular surface. And if you think that one size is going to, one lens is going to uh, fit everyone, uh, I'm sorry, but we're going to be mistaken. So the, I've got, I've broken it down into seven categories. Believe it or not, even soft disposable lenses, commodity lenses, uh, occasionally can uh, help people with uh, keratoconus, especially in the mild cases. Then we can move into soft customized. They um, become a bit tricky to get right, but uh, that can be done as well. Uh, RGPs traditionally have been the, uh, the go-to for, for decades. Small diameter, large diameter. We can then piggyback the RGPs on top of soft lenses. That works. We now have hybrid lenses where the, it's one product where we have a hard center and a soft periphery. It's all together uh, in, in one, one homogenous uh, material. They work okay. Um, then we have mini sclerals and scleral lenses. The scleral lenses are up to 18 millimeter, or actually more than 18 millimeter in diameter. I've actually got uh, some examples of scleral lenses that I'm happy to sort of send around uh, in due course so you can uh, have a look at them. Um, scleral lenses uh, have got a, a long, long history. Uh, they believe it or not, they started in the 1890s. Some German ophthalmologist, uh, forget his name, used to make them out of glass. And um, then they were, developed as a fellow called Dallas that went to um, Morphville's Eye Hospital and had his uh, very specialized um, corneal fitting clinic and he fitted glass contact lenses and they were large and people would travel all around the world. They weren't very good. You'd only get an hour or two wear because there was zero oxygen transmission through these lenses. So, but an hour of vision was better than no vision. Luckily, they've come a long way. Um, an Australian optometrist in Perth, uh, Don Ezekiel invented the first gas permeable contact uh, scleral lens back in the 1980s. And they were kind of buried and now they've made a, a huge resurgence again with, uh, we've got technology now that can measure the eye in very intricate ways and we can customize these lenses um, really, really well now. I'm actually stunned that uh, we're in a position to fit lenses uh, with this technology now. But anyway, there's, as you can see, there's many options and there's no correct answer up front. Often you have to go through many of these options to end up with an outcome. If you get an outcome first go, you're one of the lucky ones. I, I tend to see the more complex cases and they've already tried three or four different uh, categories of lenses. By the time they see me, um, you know, we're getting very complicated and people are very stressed. And so we have uh, psychological management at that point in time too, uh, because all people want to do is just see. But in the end, once you get your result, um, there's nothing you can't do really, except maybe Mount Everest. So there's an, uh, a cross section of a, a scleral lens that sits on the white part of the eye, and it's called a sclera, and it creates a bridge all the way across the cornea and doesn't touch any part of the cornea. And consequently, it's extremely comfortable, even though it's very large. It's hard to believe when you show people these, these lenses, you say, I'm putting that in my eye, they, that must really, really hurt. Uh, I can assure you it doesn't. Uh, very comfortable. Okay, so what can you do? I, I think you can play any sport. I've got uh, three or four uh, rugby league players that play first, first grade. And, uh, you know, these guys are animals. Now they, um, they, they head eye tackles. Your head might come off, but the lenses are still in the eyes. It's uh, amazing. I mean, it's like, now, one thing that we need to be clear about is corneal grafts. If you're if you're wearing any any corneal graft, you should really avoid contact contact sports. It's very important because the graft is not as strong as a as a cornea that hasn't been uh, surgically um, uh, interfered with. So, no contact sports if you're wearing a corneal graft and um, make sure that you've exhausted all contact lens options, I think is a good idea before moving on to a corneal graft. Again, um, Stephanie will know the stats on this better than me, 
but um, from what my last reading of um, the uh, registry, the corneal graft registry is about 50% of grafts have failed within 15 years of, uh, of doing the graft. So if you're out there and you've got a corneal graft and it's older than 15 years, you're doing probably better than average. Um, but if you can get cross-linking early and avoid a corneal graft at the end, um, it has to be a better outcome. So what else can you do? You can, you can fly an aeroplane. Um, I've had people join the defense force. Uh, it's difficult, but um, they've got through, they're in the police force. It's also difficult, but you know, there's very little things that you can't do. It's just the, the, if you're overnighting and you're in an unhygienic environment, it gets tough there. So unless you're logistically perfect, uh, with your hygiene uh, in an overnight situation, especially when there's no uh, running water and um, you, you need all your solutions and stuff like that, best to avoid that. But other than that, there's no occupation really that you can't um, uh, sort of contribute to. I'll leave questions to later, because I think uh, it's, it's far better uh, on a panel discussion. So I'd like, again, I'd like to thank the Institute for uh, the invitation today and uh, thanks for turning up uh, on a Thursday night. Thank you.